Okay, this is another in a series of historical oral history interviews uh, by Eric Brenaldson of the University of Wisconsin Department of Landscape Architecture. And this is an interview that's t being uh, held on August 7th, 1987 at the home of Owen and Ann Grammy in Briggsville, Wisconsin. Um, we're going to talk with Owen tonight about um, a number of things, his recollections of Aldo Leopold, uh, his evolution as a wildlife artist, um, some of the other colorful um, stories he has to tell about his life, some of the feelings Owen has um, developed over 91 years of um, living as a naturalist as to how he feels uh, as to where the world is going today, what, what is the state of the landscape, and, and some of the things that really need attention um, today. So with that introduction, um, I'm going to start by asking Owen... Um, we're going to start by talking about Aldo Leopold. This is the hundredth. Um, this is the centennial year of Aldo Leopold's birth, and uh, he's been getting a lot of media attention this year. He's just uh, 1987 uh, has been the year where the masses uh, in America have learned who Aldo Leopold is, and so Owen Grammy was one of those people that was very fortunate to have known Aldo Leopold. So I would like Owen to to speak to that and and to tell us a little bit about his recollections um, with Aldo Leopold. Owen, let's start with, um, why don't you tell me how you got first got acquainted with Aldo Leopold and, and what do you recall about the first uh, meeting with him and your impressions of him? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, men of, of our calling usually find some way to get together. And uh, I realized at the time that I first met Aldo Leopold, and I can't recall the first meeting exactly, but I realized that he was a man that uh, uh, had the same sort of thoughts that I did, and we were sort of cast in the same mold, only eventually, uh, which I didn't know at the time, he was to uh, uh, emerge as one of the greatest uh, wildlife environmentalists and, and ecologists that ever lived, in my opinion. And uh, I, I had a long association with Aldo, uh, he came to Wisconsin, uh, as I first remember, he came as a member of the council, I, I think he was, well, he came as a member of the Conservation Commission, that's where I first met him. Uh, that is a new commission, it was it was the old uh, Wisconsin Conservation Department, and the last people that I remember there was old Barber, who was the conservation director, and a fellow by the name of Scheibel, who worked with him. And at that time, I had already uh, become part of the Milwaukee Public Museum scientific staff. And uh, so naturally, Leopold and I got together because we, we thought along the same lines uh, to a great extent. And um, when you mentioned uh, before, um, you, we were talking off the tape uh, about Barber. He was the at one time the head of the old Wisconsin Conservation Department. You told me a, a story that was pretty ironic about him asking you about some kind of a bird that was in his yard. Well, I was at the time, I was employed at the Milwaukee Public Museum as a taxidermist, and, it, and I worked under one of the greatest museum directors that ever lived, and that was Dr. Barrett, and I hadn't been at the museum very long when he told me that part of your work is going to be you know, in, in the field of conservation. And uh, I want you to build all your exhibits and uh, all that sort of thing. I was a bird taxidermist, you know. That's I got. It's a long story about how I got down there. We won't go into that. But he said part of your work and part of your duties are going to be lecturing and writing about uh, uh, natural history, about birds, mammals, and, and their relation to the environment. And I want to impress upon you the, the, the very importance of that. Now he was an anthropologist, but being a museum director. He was interested in all of the departments. Well, eventually I got acquainted with, Walt, with Aldo Leopold, and I think it was when he was first appointed on that commission over there. Uh, and uh, either that or it was when he first took his job uh, at, the, um, at the university. I think, uh, I think the understanding was that he was supposed to build up that department, which is what was later called the Department of Ecology, I guess. And uh, we naturally had things in common. Now, I, w I want you to understand that uh, Aldo and I weren't palsy wildies. I, I, I don't consider myself his best friend or anything like that. But we were thrown together a great deal, uh, having a common mutual interest. And um, 
Aldo, uh, from time to time, would call me up, or I'd call him up. And at that time, if I re if I can recall the dates correctly, we were right in the middle of this Horican Marsh fight. Okay. Uh, see, the Horican Marsh had laid. It'd been a biological desert for about 38 years, from the time it was drained until the time they got the water back onto it again. And uh, we we were, we were both fighting for the same thing, and it naturally came together very very frequently. Well, I, and I can remember one time in particular that he and, and Arlie Sharger, I used to call him Arlie, I think that was his real name, uh, uh, came over to the museum one day, and one of the, uh, one of the directors of the, uh, 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 the old conservation, no, no, the, yeah, the director of the, of the D, which is now the DNR, had resigned or for some reason or another quit. And uh, Shorger and Leopold came over to the museum and wanted me to take that job. Well, I had a pretty um, uh, uh, wonderful future ahead of me at the museum, and for various reasons I didn't take the job, but I could have, and I'm glad now that I didn't, because if I didn't, I probably wouldn't have been here tonight, because I usually mean what I say, and I say what I mean, and that doesn't always... Uh, 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 strike a loving spark with the politicians. That's for sure. And I'd have probably been fired or I, or um, uh, got into trouble over there because I told them that if uh, uh, if uh, I did take that job, that probably the heads would roll over there. Mm -hmm. Now I had a very definite reason for saying that. The old department used to be in in charge of a man by the name of Barber, mm -hmm. and he called me over there one day for something or another, something that had to do with the making of game laws or something or another, and I was led into his office. He had both feet on the desk, was smoking a big fat cigar, and, and he called Scheibel, who was his, uh, uh, who was his uh, deputy, in, and uh, uh, during our conversation, I was telling him something about what I was doing at the museum, and uh, I think it was Scheibel, who, uh, who was his deputy, said, what kind of a bird is it that runs around on the lawn Got a red breast, he yanks up night crawlers and angleworms. And uh, uh, I said, Are you talking about a robin? He said, Yes. Well, I said, Gee whiz. I said, uh, Funny, uh, you fellas being head of the Department of Conservation that don't know a robin from a, from a manhole cover, apparently. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, it, they laughed, and uh, that's the way that department started out. But by the time that Leopold got in there, things got really serious. And uh, Leopold wanted to uh, build up a department. He was given the chair. I think it was called the Wildlife Ecology Chair, I believe. And he was supposed to build up that department at the university. And uh, one day, uh, he came to the museum and he said, "If now, I, I'm, my memory may be faulty, but and I'm not sure." But he said, I, "He said they're going to abolish my chair." And I said, "What do you mean they're going to abolish it? They're going to? I've only got about five students." We're just starting this thing out, and the governor doesn't feel as though it's, it, the department is going to pay. Uh, that, that we're a big one of the big uh, recognized universities in the United States, and we got to do better than just a few students. And uh, oh, and the governor then, uh, what was his name? The governor at that time. Was the that governor at that time was Governor Kohler, if I'm if I'm correct. And uh, I said, well, I'll do what I can. I said, I mean, I don't think I have very much influence. Well, uh, Leopold, Leopold said you uh, uh, have probably have more influence than you think. Would you try and help me save that chair? I said I certainly will, because at that time I could see uh, I, I I had enough foresight to see that in environmentalism and uh, the study of ecology and the study of the interrelationship between all living things is uh, becoming to be very widely recognized in this country now. And this one I told the governor. And I said, the greatest credit that you can do to yourself is to keep that chair because that department is going to grow. Yes. In my estimation, it's going to be one of the big departments of the university someday because everything that we eat, everything that we wear is a product of the soil. And if we don't protect our rainfall and protect our wetlands, mm -hmm. which is a vital concern to all of Leopold and which he's trying to teach to these young kids, the reason, the interrelationship of all life to each other, that uh, the, the, our planet will be unfit to live in. And uh, at the rate that we're exterminating as, uh, many of the species of 
our birds, particularly at the ducks, mm -hmm. uh, the ducks, and, and I think that was right in the middle of the the duck drought in the mm -hmm. in the uh, mm -hmm. in the thirties, I mm -hmm. believe. Mm -hmm. If we don't do something about it, and if we, uh, the primary thing to do is to save our wetlands first, mm -hmm. and worry about the the open and closing and the politics of the thing uh, secondary, because first we'd better save our drinking water and our fresh air. Mm -hmm. And I told all this to the governor, and I was aware of it at that time. As I say, uh, as you mentioned before, I've lived for 91 years mm -hmm. and come to a few conclusions. <laughs> I think I still have my buttons. Oh, I'm sure and, you do. Uh, you do. Uh, the, the conclusions are that uh, we're not going to eliminate a lot of the uh, important species, but we're going to in incidentally eliminate ourselves because we're nothing but a product of the soil. Mm -hmm. And if we believe the Bible and if we believe a few other things, we're, we're made of the same stuff the stars are. Absolutely. And maybe we'll go back to the same kind of dust eventually if we don't do something about it now mm -hmm. and quit draining the back 40s and, the, mm -hmm. and allowing the Army engineers to despoil our the, our landscape and, and our very way of life. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where Leopold fit in. Mm -hmm. And he turned out, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I think that all of Leopold probably has done more good uh, for this, I won't say for the state or for the nation, for the whole globe. Mm -hmm. Because his uh, his writings and his uh, uh, his ideas are now have now taken root all over the world. So Aldo and I had a lot in common, and, and we discussed these things. Uh, but as I say, we never got re real palsy wowsy. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I never realized what a great man he was going to be. Mm -hmm. Now I would say, if somebody asked me, uh, who probably is doing more to, to save our environment, mm -hmm. to save our way of life, and to save ourselves, mm -hmm. I'd say that Aldo Leopold had more to do with it than, than the father of our country, who was George Washington. Or, any of the great men of the past. He, sure to right. me, he stands on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. He's unique. He stands alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you recall about uh, Leopold um, Owen in terms of his presence? Um, what kind of man was he in terms of his physical being? Was he soft-spoken or was he confident? Was he aggressive? What kind of man was he? Although Leopold <coughs> was one of the most aggressive men that I ever knew without making it evident because he meant every word he said and every act he took whether it was by, with a pen or by by the spoken word it was well thought out he had a he had a wonderful ecological background and he had the if i, I often wish that i had the ability to uh, put in words uh, he had a facility with words that could well be the envy of every man that uh, has anything to do with the teaching of environmentalism or with uh, uh, ecology. And I've often envied the man. When as my wife, I, I've, I've told that to my wife many times, I wish I could get up and say it the way all the Leopold could, but he was a very soft-spoken, mild-mannered man, but everything he said, he had the ability of, of when he walked into a room, and anybody asked him uh, a question about the um, uh, about any any branch of science that had to do with natural history, everybody listened because they knew he had a he had a, a certain presence about him that he that he that he uh, radiated to everybody in that room, and in my opinion, he was one of America's very very great men. Um. Okay. Let's let's um, any other stories before we move on to another topic about beyond Leopold. Do you recall anything else about Aldo Leopold that might be interesting for us to to document? Well, as I told you, we were never really palsy walsy, but he was a very mutual. He was a we. He and I both had a very mutual friend, uh, and that was in Herbert L. Stoddard, who was another a very great uh, uh, ecologist who wrote the notable book and for which he got the Brewster Medal about the Bob White Quail. Uh, and I told Bob, I told uh, Herb Stoddard one time, I wish you had the ability to put what you know. And I learned a great deal about the, the whole concept of ecology and environmentalism and what makes the world tick uh, from, uh, from you, Stoddard, if you only had the, the ability to, to uh, put in writing uh, and had the facility of words that only Leopold had. Uh, Although Stoddard wrote that very great and notable book, the Bob White Quail, you know. 
But as I say, Aldo and I were never palsy wellsy but he and Stoddard had a great deal in common, the same as Stoddard and I. And one thing that they were both cranks about uh, uh, bow and arrow shooting. And as a matter of fact, I think either he furnished Aldo Leopold with the uh, Osage orange uh, sticks that he built his bows out of, I believe. And every time they got together, everybody in the room just listened. Uh, and of course, they, they, uh, Herb Stoddard's great ambition was to kill a, a wild turkey with, a, with an arrow. And uh, I don't know whether he ever did or not during his lifetime. He's dead now. But Aldo was a great, what they call at that time, bowyer. I don't know whether that's a, a term that's used by the archers or not. But they were both um, they were both bow and arrow enthusiasts. And every time they got together, well, that's about all they talked about, aside because from from ecology and environmentalism and that sort of thing. But Aldo had a great influence over everybody that he came in contact. And as I said before, uh, he was very aggressive, but you you wouldn't know it to talk to him. But you listened. He had the ability to make you listen. Well, there's two ways of being aggressive, and that is in a peaceful way, or or by word by word of mouth, or in a violent way. And uh, he uh, he harnessed all his violence in a few very well put words. And, and as I say, you listened because it, uh, you were after having an hour's conversation with him, you knew that. Uh, the whole world is interdependent upon all its parts, and uh, all of Leopold Pol knew all the parts. He could look at a tree and make a story out of it. He could look at a at a pebble on the beach anywhere, or he could walk around over there at uh, at the uh, the Leopold Preserve and pick up a a, a piece of wood or a, a pine cone, and he could tell you and he could make an intelligent story out of you out of that. And then he had the ability of putting everything in in a few words. He said a great deal. That's and and I I, I have uh, uh, the, the the utmost of praise for all of Leopold. Uh, and I think when they made him, they broke the mold. <laughs> so you would say that all the attention this year that he is getting then is well deserved. It's not only well deserved, my friend, but we'd better listen. Okay. We'd better listen, or we won't have any world to live in uh, at the rate that we are poisoning our water. Uh, uh, p polluting our our uh, air, and and, and uh, uh, the the reason I'm so very opinionated on it is on account of Leopold and Stoddard, particularly Leopold, because I want and I have a right to ask for for clean air for my grandchildren to believe to breathe, decent water for them to drink, and a decent world to live in. And, and 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 I realize uh, and and realize more so after having read the works of all of Leopold that we are merely custodians here. We're we don't own anything, and if we don't take care of it, Lord knows what's going to happen to the world. And I think that uh, it's already happening with the with a great hole over the Antarctica now, where the ultraviolet rays are coming in, and the fact that the oceans are rising and the uh, Antarctic uh, uh, ice cap is melting. We had better sit up and listen to all the Leopold and read his works. That's a good point, Owen. Um, this summer in Wisconsin, it's been unusually hot and humid, and it seems like the climate in general is changing. Even as young a man as I am, I can remember when weather patterns were much different than they are today. What do you think? Do you think that's part of this interconnection globally? I don't only think it, I know it. I've lived long enough and seen what doesn't work in this world and I've seen the pollution go on and the, and the defilement of our environment and and uh, people say uh, uh, many friends of mine said well Grummy you're, you're making a lot of enemies I said the enemies I make in fighting for a, for a decent world to live in aren't worth having as friends any in the first place what do you um what do you think then? We're talking about tropical uh, rainforest deforestation and that sort of thing. You think that's actually throwing off the the climatic patterns then, even in the United States? Well, I have to depend upon the, the scientists that are working directly with it. <coughs> it is said, and I think I read it in the National Geographic, that one quarter or one fifth of the oxygen that we have in this world is created right there in the tropical rainforest. And if we keep on slashing them and burning them, the way they are now, we are going to be roasted to death here in a few years. 
uh, I'm not I'm not very much of a, a strong religious man and I don't remember whether it was Isaiah that said it or who said it but all of the all of the prophecies have come through and and I think the last thing he said was Armageddon and the next to the last thing he said was when the Jews get back to Jerusalem all of these prophecies have come true now the men are flying in the air like birds they're swimming under the sea like the fish the whole world is in turmoil oh just read the newspaper every day or listen to the television every night it's all you have to do so I have some very uh, my friends tell me I have some very radical thoughts uh, what can and, and they say what can one man do well I have a I have a very stock answer for that look what Hitler did to the world if you want to see what one man can do and it was a one-man show he damn near ruined the world if he, he would have ruined it if he had won the war um, it's interesting uh, the rainforest deforestation that we're talking about the, uh, that is going on a lot of it has to do with the American beef industry and producing a cheaper hamburger say for the fast food drive-up restaurants like McDonald's I wanted to add that and then in a question to you on Aldo Leopold was when he spoke before either a large audience or one-on-one, -on -one, say, was he as eloquent as his writing reflected? Uh, I don't remember of ever. Ha I don't remember of having heard him uh, make a public speech. I, that I don't remember. Uh, I have a pretty good memory, but uh, uh, he must have because a man that could write the the way he did. Of course, a lot of, there's a lot of difference between writing and. And, and speaking, you, you when you're writing, you can change your whole concept, or you can you can change your verbiage or whatever you want. When once the word is spoken, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> Owen, um, okay, you you mentioned before that that when after Leopold they broke the mold, you felt that he was sort of a one of a kind. Um, I want to ask you, given our culture and society the way it is, and and just the state of the world today. Are there Leopold types amongst us? Is our culture and society still capable of producing Leopolds or John Muirs or those type people? Yes, because Aldo Leopold made it possible through his writings. Men like yourself that, that read all his works or like myself or like, yes, I think that there is some hope. There's uh, tens of thousands of us that would like to do something, but there's very few of us that uh, can do it. Now, I try to do it. Uh, 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 while I was working at the museum, uh, part of my duty was lecturing, uh, writing articles for books and magazines, and that sort of thing, and and uh, uh, creating groups to uh, instill in our youngsters going to school the through visual experience what these birds would look like and what they were worth to them, what they ate, and 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 what the birds' part uh, in the world is. And, and uh, one time I read something that if it weren't for the birds, for instance. Uh, eating the insects that in one year's time the surface the land surface of the earth would be covered to a depth of 17 feet with dead insects well now of course that's rather far-fetched because uh, uh, everything everything it's a predatory world everything eats each other and uh, uh, the big fish eats a little fish and the and uh, I told a lady one time that was very much against trapping and very much against hunting and fishing and all that I said listen that piece of that beefsteak that you had for dinner at our table here, I said somebody had to go out and kill that poor little calf with those beautiful pleading eyes that hit him over the head with an axe and cut his throat. Do you approve of that? Well, no. I said you eat the meat. So I said uh, uh, it was, everything eats each other. That's the way. It's a predatory world, and you and, and you've got to face it. Owen, uh, as long as we're talking about a great naturalist, uh, Leopold, let's move on to another um, Wisconsin great naturalist. That would be John Muir. Um, you were born in 1896, if that's if I'm correct. And so John Muir died in 1914. Do you have any recollections uh, of stories you may have heard about Muir? or uh, How much do you know about Muir? Can you help me out on that? I, I know very little about Muir, only what I've read, the same as you. I couldn't tell you any more than what you've already read. I know that he was a great, a great man, but not, <coughs> not in the same sense that Leopold was. I don't think. Uh, Leopold, Muir, uh, Leopold would often quote Muir. On, you know, he'd often refer to Muir on things. Uh, yeah, Muir was a, a, a different kind of a scientist. I don't think he was 
Well, he wasn't an ecologist, was he? Um, like, uh, uh, like Leopold was. No, more of a but naturalist. Type. He, uh, he, uh, he was a jack of all trades. I mean, he could write and he could uh, lecture and he could. Uh, uh, he had the power of persuasion too, the same as Aldo had. We've had a number of great men in this state, and I consider, uh, I consider Pro Leopold as probably right now. Uh, you mentioned the, the heat waves we've had here. We were nearly roasted to death last week. We can expect a hell of a lot more of that unless we stop our drainage. We not only better, had better stop our drainage, but we'd better reverse it. And um, uh, men like me were, of course, um, uh, 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 we're, we're conscious of the same thing. But Muir wrote very widely about a, wide, a, a, a number of things. And was a, as you say, he was a great naturalist, where Leopold was more or less of an ecologist. I agree with you. I agree with you. Let me shut it off, Owen, so we can. Let's see if I can. OK. Owen, um, something I want you to elaborate more on is, um, because I think you've got a real unique uh, insight and vision. Uh, that's been developed and has evolved over 91 years of, of perception. And I want to know, uh, clearly, what, what do you think um, is the state of the landscape now? And, and I'm talking about in a global sense. What, what are the priority issues that need confronting um, around the world today, environmentally? What had we better do quickly in order to save ourselves and everything else? You said, you uttered one word. That's very important. You said quickly. Time, time has, has actually run out on us, uh, I think. We had better listen to the authorities on these various scientific subjects who have written, who have s talked about, uh, about the uh, uh, environment. Uh, the time to do something is now. This, the, the, uh, I don't know just how to put it into words, but the studies have all been made let us apply our science right now. Uh, and and I, I don't agree with the president at all when he says we need more study. We need more study. Time has actually run out on us, and we had a demonstration of that here just this summer. Now look at Africa, the Sahel, the way that uh, they're making what's happening, or what's happening in South America. They're making desert, making a desert out of, out of, a, out of a biological paradise. If I were to um, try to encapsulate it uh, in a few words, let me put it to you this way. Uh, I don't want to get into the politics of the thing because that would get me and everybody else that's interested in a lot of trouble. But I told a man just the day before yesterday, I said, we can change our politics in either of two ways. We can change it by the vote and if that doesn't work, we can change it by violent revolution or some kind of revolution. And because if we don't, we won't have any world to live in. Now, I mean, that's just, it's got to the point now where we have got to act and forget about the studies. The studies are all in. The, uh, the uh, notes are all made by the scientific men of the world. If we don't listen, listen, we won't have any world to live in, and, and uh, we'll see Armageddon within our own lifetimes. Now, that's the most powerful statement I can make. Well, I completely agree with you, Owen, and, and you put it very well. Now, being uh, in an academic state at present myself, I can tell you that most of the monies that go that flow through a university are spent for research, further research, and. Oftentimes, it's research that doesn't need researching. It's researching the research after the research, and it's it's. Uh, I, I totally agree with you on that. And I, the other thing that that's getting priority, of course, is this uh, attitude of of uh, some kind of a confidence that that we can still we still have time to educate the masses. And as as a environmental educator, at least I've played that role uh, and and do now. Um, it's very frustrating because I see us making maybe two steps forward in terms of progress, but oftentimes then that being followed by three steps backward. And I don't know if we have the time, in fact, to change cultures and to change, uh, uh, you know, regional societies and, and people, even as individuals. Uh, how do you feel about that? In other words, you, what I hear you saying that we should 
maybe take the efforts and the dollars that we're spending on research and trying to slowly, slowly, by generation after generation, educate these people and change attitudes. Maybe what we should do, because of the ecological hourglass being real low on sand right now, maybe what we should do is channel or funnel our efforts into real action. Uh, you don't need to ask me that qu <coughs> question because you just put it into words. That's exactly how I feel. The time to do it is now. It's it's not too late. Or is it? Because if we don't do something soon, our children are going to have one hell of a world to live in. The time to do something, it's a, the time for the research is over. The chips are down. Uh, we had better start saving. Well, where will we start? Let's start saving our wetlands. That would involve politics. It would involve business. It would put a lot of people out of work and put a lot of people in work. Uh, if we don't do something about conserving our water, we won't have any rainfall anymore. Now, that has been demonstrated in the Sahel, all through the Middle East. It's happening in Africa, everywhere. The deserts are growing. What... How, uh, do we have to be hit on the head to be to made to realize, or do we have to be star <coughs> starved before we learn anything? It's time that we listen to the men that know now and forget about the study. The study, again, I repeat, the study has all been done. Let's do something about it, politically or otherwise, whatever it takes, because the cost is going to be too great if we don't. What do you think it is about human nature that uh, makes it so difficult uh, for us at trying to change people's attitudes and educate them as to the importance of nature and, and natural systems? Uh, is, it, is it human greed? Is it, is it selfishness? What, what is it that people you know, resist so uh, to change and, and live uh, by nature's laws? Uh, number one, there's too many people in the world, and, and the population is growing by it leaps and bounds and another thing uh, we learn nothing from history that's what history teaches us that we don't learn anything from history all the things that have never worked before there's a new generation coming up they think they are the generation that everything points up to them now and here this world is going to go on after we uh, after we're gone unless we blow it up and we have the capability of doing that now uh, uh, in the, n item number one, I think there are too many people in the world. Number two, in order to do anything about this, if we don't do it right now, somehow we're going to have to change human nature. They're the way of, of thinking. Uh, we're going to have to. We're going to have to make people believe that they're going to have to earn their leisure or earn the the right to live on this world. Because if they don't, the world will blow up. Owen, uh, you mentioned earlier that oftentimes uh, friends and, and perhaps colleagues through the years have, have considered you to be quite radical in, in some of your opinions and beliefs. Why is it that um, when, when one, say, that, that sees clearly and, and recognizes reality and the truth, such as a man of your, yourself, like yourself, um, and when you speak the truth, when you, when you see things and, and you relate reality to people, why is it that they... Uh, run from it and call you a pessimist and and say that you're you're a radical or a doomsdayer or whatever. Uh, there is a real difference between a pessimist and a realist. And if reality indeed is in that state of affairs, such a dire straits as it is, uh, it appears to be pessimism. But in in fact, it's 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 rea it's realism. Um, certainly, where there is real optimism, I'm sure that you'd be the first one to to recognize it and to to be very happy uh, for that, that ray of optimism and, and, and see that we do have some hope. Um, I just want to speak to that a little bit because uh, I find myself, in fact, um, identifying with you very well because um, I also have been uh, labeled more than once a bit of a boat rocker and, and uh, because I do speak out and I, I do more or less relate things as I see them and I, I'm not, I certainly am not optimistic in general. I, I and I think I share that with you. And, and can you t talk to me a little bit about that? Well, one of the great 
troubles with the world is greed, the almighty dollar, and all that sort of thing. But uh, uh, the people that, that uh, so many people that have the facts are afraid to speak out for, for fear of the results, the, uh, which could end up uh, in imprisonment in some cases, you know, and in, in, in the case of a man knows he's right and knows that certain men that have got the facts uh, could present them to the public, but the public won't listen. We'd rather take the easy way out of everything. That's the... Uh, we would rather, for instance, uh, supposing that <coughs> our air conditioning, for instance, what's the what's the gas that uh, that's uh, destroying our ozone... Uh, 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 Freon, yeah. Uh, we'd rather have the air conditioning and be and be uh, comfortable today than have the world the whole world roast in a, in a few years if we don't do it. I mean that that answers your question. We are thinking of the short pull instead of the long haul. Oh, and if if you were my age today. Uh, if we were just to switch positions here in, in chronologically, um, what would you do? What would you be doing? Where, you know, what would you? How would you live? I do exactly the same thing you're doing right now. You're doing the best you can in trying to get your message across. Uh, in my own case, I'm trying to do it through art and to, to create a love for the for the beautiful. And uh, and I could I could I realize I'd make a good rabble rouser. But somebody has to speak out, and it's up to men like you and me and the rest of the and, and the scientists of the world who have the facts to try by every means possible to get the facts <coughs> to the people before it's too late. Um. Oh, and some years ago, I remember seeing a painting of yours that uh, still is imprinted in my mind very, very well. And, and at the time I, I first saw it, it, it moved me. I, I felt it really touched me. And I, I don't think I've since seen any stronger statement by an artist. Um, yeah, I think the title, and you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, was called Requiem to Horicon Marsh. And I guess my question to start off with now is. Do you feel that the Horicon Marsh is still in a requiem state? The Horicon Marsh story is a very long one. And I was in on it from, I can't say from the beginning, but because I think it was drained about, it completely drained in about 1914 or 16. And it was remained as a biological desert for at least 35 years. <coughs> and that's one... <coughs> One good thing that President Roosevelt did, he gave us money to restore the Horican Marsh, and I give him credit for that. He also gave us a good navy, and I give him credit for that too. But uh, but uh, the real uh, mover in the Horican Marsh was uh, a man called her Curly Radke. His name was Lewis Radke from Horican. I was just one of the people that uh, tried to do what I could to bring it back to its original state. No, not its original state, but to the kind of um, the marsh it was back in, uh, oh, we'll say 1912 and 13, when it was just full of ducks all the time. Now the important part of the, of the Horican Marsh is it was a great it was a great storage basin for water. And one of the main things that uh, we've got to think about is water. We talk, I think we talked a little bit about that before, and but I took I took a great deal of <coughs> of interest in it in trying to save the wetlands, which, of course, is very important. And um, this Requiem picture, you know, back in just a few years ago, you can, you many of us, us remember, when they were hazing the Horican Marsh, I said it was purely a political thing, which it was. <coughs> they, <coughs> they wanted to drive the ducks out of Horican and drive them down to the guns in Illinois. Well, they had the mafia and everything else down in Illinois, and and uh, they, 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 were, they, they weren't getting enough game. They allowed them two geese a day, but that wasn't enough. And the, the, our own Conservation Commission, along with the Fish and Wildlife Service, didn't have the guts, to, and, and I say guts with, with, with a venom, 
to, to, um, to do anything about it, and they took part in this hazing. And uh, when they got the water down low enough, all they did was create a, 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 a stink basin for, for botulism and everything else. And I, and I painted that picture uh, as a protest. It's the only real political picture that I had ever done in my life. And, uh, and uh, because uh, uh, we tried to fight that hazing business there, and every, we won't go into that because everybody knows what a damn fool thing it was to do. And not only damn fool, but just a dumb thing. And I thought that the cops, the DNR had more brains than to even fall for anything like that, but they fell for it hook, line, and sinker and played along with the, federal, with the federal government, and they brought the water down to a point to where they had a botulism, which the general public never found out about because they didn't want us to find out what a failure their hazing was. It didn't work, and uh, I painted, uh, I gave it, I felt so strongly about it that I gave a, uh, was on television somewhere up in either in Green Bay or in uh, Wausau, and I said that um, I'm going to paint a protest picture about this. And I said, because uh, we, owe the, we owe the lawyers $5,000. We tried to sue the government for, for, for malpractice or, or whatever you call it, for, for their big blunder, which was the hurricane marsh, re-drain, or re-drainage again. And we owed the lawyers $5,000. And I said to, over television uh, that I'm going to paint a picture, a protest picture, I'm going to charge five thousand dollars for, or ten thousand, or whatever it was, for, for that picture, and somebody out there that, within the hearing of my voice, is going to pay for it. Well, the result was that I no sooner got back to the hotel, and somebody says, "Here's your five thousand dollars." Well, I said, "I can't accept that five thousand dollars because I haven't even painted the picture yet." Well, consequently, uh, I belong to them. A very strong uh, member of the, not a strong member, but a, a, long, a lifetime member of the of the CNRA, which is the Citizens Natural Resources Association. So I painted that picture to get money to pay the lawyers the $5,000. Well, right now in our kitty, we've got, uh, uh, we've got over $30,000, uh, and they can't spend any of that money without my approval for anything else. It's got to be if the government ever tries it again, we're not going to be caught short of funds so we can pay lawyers to make it the damn fool out of them, which they were then when they did that. Yeah. Um, as we sit here, um, we're enjoying your wife Anne's peanut butter cookies and ice water. And um, there was an interesting story you told to me the other day um, about Anne baking some biscuits and and you trying you working on a painting and you had her come upstairs and critique your painting. And can you can you tell me about that? Well, uh, we she doesn't come up and interfere with my painting, and I don't go downstairs and interfere with her cooking. But she came up and I called. I called through the intercom and said, "Come on up. I want to show you a picture that I think is pretty nice." And when she got up there, she said, "That's all pretty nice, but your clouds look exactly like the uh, biscuits that I just took out of the oven." And that that took me down a few pegs. Well, I'll tell you, my wife Anne uh, is probably one of the fi- the best critics that I have. And if it weren't for Anne, I don't think I'd be painting because I can't cook and I I I, I can't do any of the of the household work and she does all my correspondence and answers the telephone and the doorbell and feeds me well and I think that's why I'm alive today that um, if it wasn't for the, the fact that she was a good cook and and she helps me out in many other ways and takes care of what social obligations I have and all that sort of thing and she is a g- very great help and a very dear pal to me in that way as I said before I don't, I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't if I had to do the work she does I wouldn't have any any time to paint so we get along just great and we've, we've been married for 65 years I meant to say for 60 years <laughs> no it doesn't seem like 65 at all I, I love her just as much today as I ever did so but she's been a, but I think that's one of the very important things that, that an artist or a scientist must have you must have a good wife that's that, that particularly knows how to take care of him and can relieve him of a lot of his work. I don't answer the telephone or I don't answer the doorbell. She takes care of that all for me, as well as all my cor- uh, correspondence and and uh, finances, etc. I call her the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> Owen, uh, now that was really, I 
I was touched again by what you just said about Anne. I, I appreciated that a lot, and, and I can see it's it's certainly true. Um, some of the other people that you knew um, years ago, like Arlie Shorger, uh, I'd like to talk a little about him. And also, if you knew Ernie Swift, maybe we could we could mention um, Ernie as well. I knew Ernie Swift very well. We got along very beautifully together. Uh, he had he had many of the same ideas I have. But he's up against the same sort of thing that everybody else is, trying to convince the public, you know. And it costs a lot of money to, to do some of the things that uh, are, are going to be really necessary to take care of our environment now. And uh, Ernie Swift was probably one of the finest uh, uh, directors of the DNR that we ever had. Now, you had spoke about Arlie Shorger. Uh, Arlie Shorger uh, was, a, was a very successful Madison businessman, but he was also a very uh, scientifically minded man. He was on the commission, uh, 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 the Conservation Commission, which was, it was called at the time, but he was one of the finest bird uh, experts that we had in the state at the time, and we spent a lot of time together at different times at the, while I was working at the museum, uh, and he wrote probably one of the finest books that's ever been written about the extinct passenger pigeon. I think it's called 1987 in the home of <clears throat> Ann and Owen Gromie at Briggsville, Wisconsin. And Owen was talking uh, when the first side ended about uh, Arlie Shorger and, and his work uh, entitled The Passenger Pigeon. And we'll just take off with that here. I see a great connection be between the passenger pigeon and the problems we have today. Uh, the passenger pigeons were, were so numerous that they are said to have darkened the sky. And I don't think that there's any living man uh, today who has ever seen a living passenger pigeon. Well, now we don't want the same thing to happen to our waterfowl. That is, and I'm, speak, I'm not speaking only of ducks. I'm speaking of all waterfowl that are very, very important uh, to us. We don't want to see the same thing happen to them as happened to that passenger pigeon. There's no living passenger pigeon, and with that in mind, and the great shortage of, of marsh ducks or, or puddle ducks, and all waterfowl that we have now due to man's mismanagement of our natural resources, particularly as it has to do with the Army engineers and the drainage, that there's a, a, a parallel, and knowing and realizing that parallel, I talked to the people that just that just published my last book, the Stanton and Lee uh, people at um, um, Madison about uh, about the plight, the plight of the waterfowl and I said there's a, par a direct parallel between that and the passenger pigeon so with that in mind I painted a picture of a passenger pigeon um, and I got my primary information on what the, the great flights of passenger pigeons used, used to look like from uh, from Dr. Shorger's um, a book on the, the on the passenger pigeon and it's going to be another propaganda picture. Uh, it'll probably be, be come out sometime this fall, or pretty soon. As a matter of fact, uh, the Stanton and Lee people, a publishing company, now own the picture, and and uh, Bud Gussell of uh, Wisconsin Dells own another one, and we're going to use both of them in a in a in a uh, a way that will bring the plight of the waterfowl. Uh, to 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 public attention, uh, this and uh, using uh, the passenger pigeon as a uh, uh, as a as a uh, as a horrible example of what we're doing to our natural environment and particularly to our birds. Now uh, the passenger pigeons at one time, uh, Dr. Shorger, I think it was, said uh, that uh, they darkened the skies and darkened the sun. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but there was one flock of passenger pigeons that went over uh, what was then called Kilburn City that was uh, over 100 feet deep from the bottom to the top. They said that there were three passenger pigeons to the cubic yard and that you couldn't see the sun, that there was enough birds uh, to, to cover the sun. The sun just flickered at you when you looked up at it, from what he said. And... Uh, the statisticians and and uh, people that calculate those things scientifically would not 
even estimate the, the billions of birds that there were in that one flock. And all of a sudden, the, the last pigeon died in 1913. Uh, her name was Martha at the Cincinnati Zoo. And the Audubon Society for years after that offered a reward of $1,000 for anybody that could bring in a live or dead passenger pigeon, particularly a live one, for the mate for the one in the systematic in the uh, Cincinnati Zoo. Well, you see, the passenger pigeon laid only one egg, and, uh, and the one shipper from the Wisconsin Dells uh, shipped over a million of them in barrels of salt. I think he sent it to Detroit. That didn't include the number they sent to Chicago, Kansas City, and, and uh, Pittsburgh. And the farmers were around here were slaughtering them. They, they, they closed the schools in, in the Dells, or the, the then called Kilburn City, so that the kids could get in on the slaughter. And they got a penny apiece for all of those that they could, the young birds, the squabs, that they could shake out of the trees. Well, we don't want to see the same thing happen to our waterfowl. And we're going to use that picture that I painted and the one that uh, Bud got, Mr. Gussell has got over at the Dells uh, as the horrible example of what can happen to our waterfowl <laughs> if we don't, what, if we don't uh, take greater conservation measure, measures. 